Alhamdulillah, it's a great honor, privilege that we are here today celebrating the end of the Mubarak, blessed month of Ramadan when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the tawfiq to fast, to recite the Quran, to stand in Taraweeh, to make dua, to make dhikr, to feed people, to help people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of that from us and give us the tawfiq to do this continuously throughout the, throughout the year, inshallah. This Salat of Eid is a celebration of the breaking of the fast. And that's why it's called Eid al-Fitr, the Eid of breaking fast. So Muslims, when they celebrate for the sake of Allah, they celebrate through ibadah, through worship. They don't celebrate by dancing, by drinking, and by doing other things. Islam is a dignified religion. It honors human beings. It gives all human beings dignity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> Indeed, we have given the children of Adam dignity. We have dignified human beings. So as a sign of dignity, Muslims, they offer Salat of Eid as a sugar, as an appreciation, as a gratitude for the ibadah Allah allowed us to do. This is the way a civilized religion behaves. That you thank your Lord, your Maker, your Creator, so that He can increase you in His bounties, and with his gifts. The issue of dignity, as you know, is unfortunately throughout the world today where there is a distinct lack of offering dignity to human beings, especially those who are Muslim. You go to Rohingya, you go to China, you go to Kashmir, you go to Yemen, you go to Syria, and you go to the African nations. And then, recently now, you have a continuation of the brutal assassination of human dignity in Palestine and Palestine. We as Muslims honor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through honoring Him, we honor His creation. Islam does not allow Muslims to tamper with Allah's creation. Islam doesn't allow Muslims to hurt any of Allah's creation for no reason. In fact, when Abu Bakr anhu became the Khalifa, one of the first instructions he gave to the army was that they should not, they should not hit a tree because the leaves will fall and you will be taking away the leaves from the tree for no reason. You should not hurt animals. And definitely not human beings. So these are the noble, dignified values of our civilization, of the Muslim civilization, which finds itself steeped in the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most dignified and most honorable human being Allah has created. And the way he created human beings, the way he treated human beings, the way he had respect for other human beings, whether they were friends or foes or enemies, people who were his companions and people who hated him, it was the same. Everybody in this country talks about equality. 
We have our problems in this country in our backyard. We have violence on the south side, which we haven't been able to resolve for decades. We have Black Lives Matter. We have so many issues in this country that revolve around human dignity, where human beings don't value the lives of other human beings simply because of their color, or because of their background, or because of their language, or because of their customs. This is not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants Muslims to see the world. Muslims see the world as a creation of Allah. That's our world view. Our world view is Allah is the Khalid. The creator and everything else is in Allah's creation. And the way we honor Allah's creation is through his guidelines. Through the honorable, noble values that this great civilization now has to offer to all human beings. And as Muslims, we must represent these values both individually and collectively. As individuals, we have to be careful that we don't exploit the people who are with us. We don't undermine their worth and their value. And we don't exploit them. Whether they be our spouses, our children, our neighbors, our relatives, or whether it be our co-workers, our employers, our employees, our teachers, our students. We have to treat them with the dignity that we deserve to be treated with. And then collectively, what is our responsibility? Or perhaps in a better way, what is the value we represent when we see human dignity being abused and in fact slaughtered? What is our responsibility? What is the value we give to other human beings? So yes, if there's a black man in the USA that's been murdered for no reason, then we speak. We write. We talk to each other. We talk to our neighbors. We talk to everybody that we know. We talk about it. Talking about it is the least thing we can do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has angels with us. There are two angels that record our deeds all the time, 24-7. As we're speaking here today, you're listening. Allah's angels are recording everything we're doing here. So if there is no action recorded by the angels when we see and hear exploitation and a total slaughtering of human rights, then on the day of judgment, what excuse will we have? Allah was saying, let's see what the angels wrote. And the angels wrote nothing when you hear people are being killed, assassinated, executed, for no reason other than that they're different. Then we won't have any face to show in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels won't record anything. But even if we make a dua or we'll say something to someone about it, then that deed will be recorded and we will have now justification in front of Allah to say we did at least something. So as you heard, you should write to our senators, our congressmen, we should talk to them, phone them, we should write to newspapers. This country as perhaps somewhat in terms of foreign policy, foreign policy won't change. So we don't expect that upheaval will turn around foreign policy unless Inshallah, one day everybody becomes Muslim in this country. So we shouldn't be, you know, fantasizing that one day the US foreign policy will change. It doesn't change. That's been said for the next 50 years, 100 years. But what we can do is try and make a change in the environment around us. In our own family units, we should not be shy to speak about it as we talk about and gossip about everything else in the world. Likewise, we should spend five minutes a day speaking about these values. Because this is who we are. And if Muslims don't represent the values Islam offers to ourselves and to other human beings, no one else is going to do it. We can't ask the non-Muslims here to fight our battle. This is our battle. These are Muslims who are being slaughtered. 
They're not non-Muslims. All of these people, these countries I've mentioned, they're all Muslim countries, all Muslim people. We as Muslims have to fight our battle. So even though we may write to congressmen and speak to senators and so on, they're not going to fight for us. And I don't mean fight in the sense of violence. I mean fight in the sense of speaking about our principles. Representing the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loudly and clearly. And not to be shy to say that Alhamdulillah I'm a Muslim. People are sometimes embarrassed. After 9-11, Alhamdulillah things are okay now. Give them Allah, keep them that way, whatever. After 9-11, Muslims changed their names. They didn't want to be called Ahmad. They didn't want to be called Muhammad. They changed their names because they were so insecure about the idea that in this country, if you stand up for your rights, you will be respected. You will be honored. You will be seen as a hero. Instead of shying away and then digging a hole in ourselves and going into that hole head first. What did Muslims do? They changed their names. So what kind of representation is this? That we don't have even the courage to say my name is Ahmad or Muhammad. Where are we going with this? Is it just that we're here for the dunya, for the world to milk the fat cow, as we say? That Muslims in this country, all they do is they, they earn money, they spend, they consume, and they throw wild parties. So this is not the way we fight our battles. We fight our battles by speaking the truth, by defending the truth, by defending the honor and dignity of fellow Muslims, whether they're here in this country or anywhere else on the planet, because we're all one ummah, we're one body. As the Prophet ﷺ described the Ummah as one body. Everywhere in the world, we are one body. We have to feel the pain. Now, we may represent ourselves and the Prophet through dua. Allah help the Muslims who have been oppressed. This dua, by speaking about it to ourselves, to our family members, as a routine, daily practice in our homes. Let's talk to our children about it. And then speaking to the people who might be able to make a change. But at least we can do that. And those who have more power and those who have more authority in their workplace or wherever they are, then they should speak more and they should represent the Prophet ﷺ more according to the power and the ability Allah has given them. This is how we honor our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to conclude with a story. This is a story about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Mecca, there were very few Muslims. Very few Muslims. Barely a hundred people made hijrah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you imagine, in 13 years, in 13 years where the Quran has been revealed, and two thirds of the Quran is revealed in Mecca, only a hundred people are accepting Islam. So you can imagine the anxiety of the Prophet Sallallahu here you are, you have universal values, you have revelation coming, and only 100 people are accepting Islam. But anyway, that's the difference. The point I'm making here is that early on in Mecca, the Prophet was approached by two orphans. Two orphans. Somehow in our minds we have an idea that the Prophet was a very kind, gentle person, which is true. But when it came to honoring the dignity of other human beings, he was like a lion. He didn't back down. Prophets are not cowards. They don't succumb to the pressure of society and back away from speaking the truth. They are the bravest people Allah has created. These two orphans came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said, Oh, Muhammad, they didn't know him as Rasulullah, so they called him Muhammad. He said, we have a problem. Said, what is that? He said, that we, our parents died, and they left us inheritance. But the inheritance now is in the hands of Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, the worst cat. So he has now confiscated our 
inheritance and he is not giving us our inheritance. Is there something you can do for us? Now you have to remember that Abu Jahal is the leader of the Quraysh and Abu Jahal is a master of the people around him. And he hates Muhammad Sallallahu with passion. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows this, that he is my arch enemy. There is no greater enemy for me here except Abu Jahal. So what do you think he would have done? He said, oh, I'm, I'm not in a position where he hates me and he's against my campaign and you know, maybe you should go to somebody else who's close to Abu Jahal. No, no. Prophets are not cowards. Prophets stand for the truth. Prophets stand for the dignity of human beings. What did he do? He said, come with me right now. So he took them and he knocked on the door of Abu Jahal and said, I demand that you give these orphans their inheritance right now. But he's not the coward. He's not a chicken. He's not gentle here. So sometimes we have the misconception. Prophet was always gentle. But he was not gentle when it came to respecting, honoring dignity of other human beings. When it came to principles. He was strong. He was ferocious. He did not back down. Abu Jahal looked at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, yes, of course, of course, of course. He went into a spoon. He was mesmerized by the bravery of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was mesmerized by his audacity. He was mesmerized by his principles. This story we should take to heart. And learn from our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whom we follow, that in the face of injustice, it doesn't matter who you're in front of, you must speak the truth. You must identify with the truth. You cannot be sissies and cowards and go into a shell and say, this doesn't concern me. Why? Because it does concern you. It concerns every human being. So Abu Jahl came and he then gave them the inheritance and that was the end. So we see, my dear brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a guide, gave us a leader, gave us the last Nabi, so that we can follow him in every aspect of life. As we follow him in Salat, as we follow him in everything else, we follow him in our ethics, in our values, in our civilizational values, in our worldview. If we do this and follow the Prophet Sallallahu I see a great future, not just for Muslims in this country, but for Muslims everywhere. It is up to the Muslim to fight the battle of the Muslim. Don't expect a non-Muslim to fight your battle. That's called, you know, palming it off. Throwing the buck somewhere else. The buck stops here with us. If we don't create a change, then no one else will. So we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through this auspicious and blessed gathering, on this blessed day, on this Mubarak event and occasion, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all dignity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to fight for dignity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen.